um, in my headphones, Charles. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Hello, 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 one and all. Welcome to another episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. With me today is my good friend and co-host, uh, Dylan. Say hello to the people. Hello to the people. And my name is Charles, and the two of us are so happy to be with you guys today for yet another groundbreaking, unprecedented uh, change to the format for Friends, uh, Friends Talking Fantasy. Yeah, well, we were having so much fun and we had so much to say about the Poppy War by RF Kuang and our attempt to record our single Buddy Read discussion episode of it like we typically do. And we just realized while we were doing it that the the best way to go about things is to produce two episodes on it because we were going to run out of time and we had so much more to say yeah we we try and cap the episodes as much as we can to be on like around an hour hour and 10 minutes max sometimes we get a little longer than that but definitely under an hour 30 and we were like 50 minutes in an hour in and we were like dude we we have not even left syngard yet and so we knew we had to just break it into a two-parter so um well, Dylan, you want to just kind of bring us to, to where we left off, I guess? I will in just a second. I also want to give yes. a warning that this episode does include spoilers of the Poppy War. <laughs> so yes. you probably could have guessed that if you've listened to part one. But if you're a rebel and we're trying to start with part two of this whole thing... <laughs> <laughs> I, I if, you, wanna... if you'd rather skip the synagogue part and and, <laughs> and get right to like uh, post synagogue, then this is the place for you. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, yes, like Dylan said, thank you. There are spoilers for the Poppy War, um, just as there will be for part one. And if you have not read Poppy War and you're considering it and you want to learn more, go back on our channel to an episode called Why We Have to Read Poppy War, where Dylan gives a very rousing uh, pitch. Of a the space series. rousing. A space rousing pitch of Poppy War that's entirely spoiler free. Uh, definitely want to start there. Then you want to go after you read the book to part one, and now you're here at part two. So welcome on this journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. Charles, I'm always happy to take a journey with you, my good yeah. lifelong friend, uh, as we... <laughs> I appreciate that. If you like Poppy War and you liked our part one and you're here, leave us a review. You know, we always say that at the end, but let's say it at the top while people are still listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on us for hoping that anyone would want to listen to <laughs> us draw on for over an hour and then would still like us enough to want to give us a five-star review. So let's just tell them now before they have the chance to realize that they don't like this. Yeah, or, you know, sometimes just <laughs> life gets in the way. You, you only can give so much time to dedicating to an pod, episode of a podcast Maybe you only catch the first 30 minutes, even if you wanted to hear more. So definitely yeah. check us out. You can tell any, Charles any is the way marketing you guy. Interact. Yeah. And I'm the one willing to be authentic because I'm the psych guy. Yeah. I would say that anyone that makes it to the end would would be more likely to give us a positive review. That's because true. Because they've heard the whole thing. Um, however, I imagine most people are going to break up their listening. And um, this is just a good way to remind them at the top. There is proven marketing evidence to ask people to like subscribe and follow and stuff at the beginning. It's annoying, but it's proven to be effective. So we'll give that a try. <laughs> Anything you do to interact with our channel at this point would be greatly appreciated. So and whether that's through social media <laughs> or through reviews or through email. So yeah, let's start a dialogue. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Well, let's get to the book that we said we'd be discussing yes. here, Charles. Poppy War, RF Kwan, <laughs> part two. Well, we're... Right at where war has broken out, the Federation of Mugen is invading Nakara, which is the empire that 
Rin and everyone else that we've become acquainted with uh, live in. And pretty quick, we're into a battle where <laughs> Rin and her classmates are having to fight together against these invading Federation troops. So mm-hmm. I I guess I can say what happens in it, which is uh, Rin and Nesha end up fighting together, and they've kind of been rivals. I, really like I do like that too. They've been they've been rivals for very long, and we get to see this moment where they are both very very competent fighters. They were in the finals of the tournament together, so you could say the two best fighters in their class, and. They have a common enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And yes. all of a sudden, they're fighting in sync in such an impressive way. Eventually, they get to a point where this big general, who is pretty tough for them to face, is coming in. And he stabs Neja. And Neja looks like he's he might be dead during this time. And Rin starts using her phoenix powers, despite all the warnings from her mentor, Jang. And also, Jang uses his guardian powers. He's revealed to be one of these big three uh, folks who basically right. were the reason why the Empire got, uh, like, I don't know, consolidated be the best way to say that <laughs> and uh it's and, the, the second poppy war ended right by the influence of the trifecta yes true and we get to see jang come in and be a total <laughs> can i say badass charles is that gonna cost us <laughs> our explicit uh, that's rating fine <laughs> you might have to beep that out he he's a total badass and he just unleashes his guardian menagerie on them and that's true it's the first time we see kind of a savant of uh uh, shaman powers a shaman well yeah i know the i I wasn't you saying savant is that's the word but it's someone who's actually can use this god channeling power in combat effectively because we've only seen it through rin which is very um wild untapped not sure what's going on and then we see um Zhang step in and effectively put an end to the battle. Yeah, Riley's getting <laughs> riled up about that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is pretty cool to see. And we end up in this situation then where Rin is detained for a while. Well, she also taps into her god powers again. And there's this interesting thing well, where the yeah. general's like, I thought you were dead. I watched you die or whatever, uh, which is some interesting like lore building kind of thing. It's interesting that we're reminded that we're in Rin's perspective entirely, which adds a little intrigue to whatever that means where you thought who died, you know? <laughs> true. And I think it's, it's cool to... See, we we always got the sense that Jang was more than meets the eye here. Yes, and I know I I personally maybe you did too. Charles was guessing before that that he was the guardian in particular. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know. it yeah. wasn't that shocking of a reveal. Yeah, he's the but it is cool to right? see. Yeah, it is. Oh, is it gatekeeper, not guardian? They call him the gatekeeper. Okay. I don't yeah, know if we find it out in that moment or not, but we do. He is the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper. Yeah. So sorry about that. Gatekeeper. And well, we knew the gatekeeper had that the powers that he used. Yes. So it's, you know, he, he can connect those two when he does this. And fun to see it happen. And it, it happens pretty quick. You can think of some other series where the mentor waits a, a few books before, or more <laughs> before really showing you what they're capable of. And right, and then he shows his powers and just buried under a pile of rubble, presumed to be dead. Mm-hmm. So, yep. also a very abrupt end to that phase of her life. <laughs> and this is a turning point in some ways for Rin, where she 
loses her mentor, I would say, not just literally, but figuratively, where she she has been weighing the ideas that Jang has been sending her way. And she was kind of getting to a place where she was like, uh, maybe I shouldn't be using these powers. Maybe there's right. something to what this guy is saying. But I'll take these poppy seeds into battle just in case. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and when She's push like, comes, I'm to not sh- going to die without trying. So yeah. <laughs> so when push comes to shove, she does take them, and she does use her powers. So and she also, when she sees Zhang use them as a tool, also, and when she sees the dis- the total destruction of war, and Neza gets stabbed, and Zhang gets buried in rubble, she's like. I can never allow this to happen. I, sh- I should have used these powers from the start and could have prevented all this. So she's starting to see that kind of change in her mind where she's going away from her master's teachings. Yep. Which she never fully adopted in the first place, but she no. was entertaining them for a while. And uh, props to Jang for even being able to get someone as stubborn and, uh, <laughs> let's say, focused as Rin to... <laughs> yes consider all the things he was saying it's absolutely counter to how i perceive her disposition very very true so that happens and then rin once she gets exposed as this basically shaman she gets assigned to the psych that she does and there's there's an interesting sequence where they don't really know what to do with her where she's being detained. I don't know how much more we have to speak about oh, that. Oh, yeah, they do keep her drugged and shackled, right? In the... mm-hmm. And Then the I Empress be- sees something in her, and then that's when she gets reassigned, right? Is that what mm-hmm. happens? Yeah, the Empress... So we find out that the Empress has powers. We get a hint of it, actually, when... She when Rin visits Kide's estate and she sees the Empress and there's this just feeling when the Empress yeah. looks at her where she's like, I would do anything for this person. And in yeah. that moment, it's just foreshadowing because we're like, that's a weird reaction. Rin's but... not usually one to submit to someone else, especially just with a glance. Yeah. So something feels off. And then we get this interlude, which I think is the only part where we aren't in Rin's perspective, where the Empress betrays the site commander at the time, Tyr. Yes. And we learn that the Empress has these sort of hypnotic powers and, and maybe more going on too. So at this right. point... she's the serpent, which is one of the... Tri- which is the last remaining member of the trifecta, right? Is the serpent? Yeah. I, I, I'm not positive on the name serpent, but it sounds right. Oh, right. Okay. But either way, one of the trifecta. Obviously, I didn't get Gatekeeper right, so (laughs) that's uh, a blank space in my knowledge on this. But either way, we know she's really powerful here, and she sees this in Rin and assigns her to the psych, which is basically the shaman division of the Nakaran army. And it's got it. So first of all, she's under. Oh, the vipers! It's the vipers. The vipers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. So Sorry. the new commander is Alton, and I realized yes. at the end of our last episode, I was saying it during the outro, we somehow didn't talk about Alton basically at all, even though no, it's a not... huge part of this story in the first. We episode, teased them at so. the end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we left you wanting more, and Alton up to this point has basically been more of an idea than a person really he's the person who all the masters at the at synagogue keep saying how amazing he is at everything and we know he's a spearly which is the people who basically face genocide uh in the second poppy war at the hands mm-hmm. of the federation and and nakar apparently let that happen and then we we see him briefly early on in stuff we covered in the first episode where he's fighting and he's obviously really good at fighting and Rin gets what, what feels kind of like she's 
got a crush on him or something like that. Yeah. It's uh, and there's she, definitely a, like an attraction there, even if it's just like the way you're attracted to like a celebrity. She definitely mm-hmm. has that sort of admiration. Exactly, and she flubs her one interaction with him basically at the Classic. academy which is an awesome moment for for Rin in terms of rounding out her humanity like we've been yeah, talking someone about someone is so mad of a matter of fact and direct and seemingly callous the fact that she has that like like um fumbling her words in front of a crush moment her bad first impressions it's uh it's funny. It's a funny <laughs> moment. Something we can all relate to and helps yeah. build Rin as when she makes a these more ruthless decisions, we still understand and empathize with her as a person. So yeah. then anyway, back to where we're at in the story. She's training under Alton now, and Alton is this boy wonder commander at this point. Yes, he's so, the leader of the, and we know that he's the leader because the previous leader, Tyr, we just was through his mm-hmm. point of view when he got betrayed by the Empress. So we know now that um, Alten was his his number two, and he's now the commander of the Psyche, and they're just a bunch of fellow shamans, I guess, and they all each channel a different god, and that gives them different powers. But exactly. Altan and Rin channel the same god, the Phoenix god. Mm-hmm. And we do learn at this point that Rin is a Spearly, and that's important, something that maybe you could have started to connect the dots on before this, but this is the first time that they start saying this explicitly in the story, and Alton is also Spearly, so... Right. It's it's got this interesting dynamic that starts to develop between Alton and Rin where Alton he's in some ways almost seems like a big brother, in some ways seems like someone she has a crush on, and in other ways he is he is someone who holds a lot of these admirable qualities and he's very impressive, but he's also under so much pressure throughout this time. Yes. And he starts to... Yeah, the more we get to know about Altan, the more our perception of him changes. Mm -hmm. And he basically goes from this, like, mythical celebrity status to this tragic character, which was a really interesting progression for his character arc. He's who I was referring to back in the Why We Have to Read Poppy War episode as someone who... It's interesting to watch how Kwong first presents them and then starts to round out and morph our perception without it feeling like the character has gone through some sudden change that would be out of line with what we'd Right. Expect. It's because we were so focused from Rin's perspective. And from Rin's perspective, he was just a guy that was very stoic that could beat up anybody in the tournament. And then he disappeared, and now he's a commander. So it's like... From her perspective, he's this mysterious, powerful, commanding presence. And then as she gets to know him, we get to know him, and we start to learn more about the tragic nature of like how much, like from the nature in which he was raised and his addict, his drug addictions and his hatred and like all these things. We're like, oh wow, he's actually kind of a bit of more of a, of a tragic, <laughs> tragic character. <laughs> For sure. He's a victim of so much trauma, and yes. the last remaining person, uh, or at least before he meets Rin, he sees himself as the last remaining person from an ethnic- uh, uh, ethnicity that has faced genocide, and it's just a really... A, we also learn he's gone through this these experiments that the i forget the guy's name but the guy who runs that lab is oh yeah the doing prison. on him and yeah yeah so as a child he was, i remember it was a name i started with an s and uh he was like a doctor that performed basically like human experiments in wartime um, exactly so face these absolutely horrific experiments 
experiment at the hands of this, uh, I guess, doctor or whatever from the Federation as a child and has, in part due to that, developed an addiction to opium. Mm. And he's a really complex character. And he sometimes shows Rin this kinder side that cares about her. And other times he lashes out at her and even slaps her at times. And it's... It like, can be very standoffish. Like when Rin, like Rin saw her first skirmish and she got frightened and was ineffective in battle. She wasn't able to channel the Phoenix God. And Alton was like, don't come back to me until you can actually keep up with the rest of us. And it was very much like a, a part of... Rin, that she she's trying to belong with this group. She's starting to feel like she can identify. These are a group of people that can channel gods and Altan. And she finally learns more about her own upbringing. And then Altan is very cold and dismissive to her until she learns how to become powerful. And she's kind of still toying with that idea of the price of obtaining that power. So it was a real interesting dynamic that takes place in the setting in, um, how do we pronounce this city? Kurdelain? Kurdelain? Yeah. Um, also, I'll say that this book, The Poppy War, is described as militaristic, and I think that this these moments in Kirtland are kind of the beginning of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's described as like a militaristic, grimdark fantasy novel, which it falls under those categories, I suppose. But we really start to see these kind of military tactics play out here in Coeur d'Alene. And I, I think this scene, this scene just kind of introduces the psych, introduces the kind of the more military aspects of it, and also gets us um, more familiar with Altan, that Altan-Rin relationship gets to finally develop. Exactly, Charles. And the psych is a really interesting idea, yeah. I feel it's like. It's like a suicide squad almost. <laughs> Yeah, it does remind me. I know we both read those comics, so <laughs> it does remind me of that. The element that's also similar to that is this: the psych calls the psych bit to it, which is yeah. the psych exists, yes, for assassinations, but even more so as a way to contain the psych. Yeah. Because these shamans, they often become more and more emotionally unstable as they deal with having these gods that they summon the power from who tend to basically just want more and more possession of right. them as people in their minds. Yeah, so and, they either die um, on the field of battle mm-hmm. or get totally taken over by the god that they're channeling and have like a breakdown and they can't distinguish themselves from the god and they're basically like these uncontainable powers that could have catastrophic <laughs> consequences if left unchecked. So they kind of like imprison themselves and and keep, in, keep, in, keep each other in, in check and keep that hierarchy going of like, okay, you imprison me and take over and then that person will imprison you and they have a sense of community about them. Exactly. And we get to see this embodied maybe most at first through Sunni, yes. who Alton has to soothe at times because Sunni, although maybe 95 or whatever percent of the time is very mellow and I would say likable. He worships uh, he worships a god that has gotten more and more control over him. And at times, Sunni, who's like basically a berserker when he's using his powers, uh, he becomes volatile and dangerous. And yes. Alton has figured out ways to keep him from acting on those instincts that he has. But you can see he's kind of on the edge of the point in which they would normally try to imprison them in that mountain prison, which is Chulu Korik. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. Right. It's an interesting concept. But yeah, he's uh, he's definitely kind of the... um the warning of what is possible when you have been channeling a god for so long and he's just kind of like the the warning 
the, the telltale signs of like this is someone who's starting to break. Um, but you also see Alton's character. He's trying to hold on for as long as possible and keep his team together as long as possible. He doesn't really accept the idea that they're broken and need to be imprisoned, right? He He's of the understanding that it can be controlled and there's no reason to imprison these people or kill these people. Like, we can keep them contained. We can use them. And and that this is kind of the beginnings of that, which brings Altan back to that prison to try and to free people to amass an army when we get when we get that desperate. But this is the beginning of like, he's fine. I can control him. We're all good here. Even though he's basically, <laughs> pardon this turn of phrase, basically playing with fire. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, were you up all night with a pen and a pad? No, up I thought with? of it just now. I'm like, am I really going to say that? <laughs> I know I've dropped some bad puns on the show too, so <laughs> it's <laughs> it's probably fair game. And and it's a metaphor. I'm sure Kwong had a nice laugh with her internally too, of like, oh, this idea of playing with fire. <laughs> I'm sure she thought of it. <laughs> So we <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure Charles? <laughs> so then we end up dealing with a situation that Alton gets us be- this great victory using his psych command which everyone's really impressed with for a little while until it ends up leading to a situation where Mugen feigns that they're going to surrender and right. then sends in this group to discuss actually the surrender of Nakara, not the surrender of Mugen. Mm-hmm. And then they just blow up the <laughs> encampment using this what looked like salt but was actually explosives. And it's pretty brutal and probably the first really, really brutal moment of this. Right. And Kwong did a good job of weaving in all the pieces to kind of put that together. She introduced the munitions expert. She introduced the use of salt and sugar and as like provisions. And then she had them come in with the white flag. So it was all this kind of buildup, which I thought was really well constructed and yeah, this this is again another moment where it's like just like when um, Synagard was attacked. Now we are at this moment where like all bets are off. <laughs> what, what we thought was like, oh, they're under the um, the white flag. They wouldn't do anything under the pretense of a parlay. And then they just go ahead and blow up everybody, including themselves. And um, that was a really that was the beginning of like, this war is not going to be a pleasant one. (laughs) This is not going to be an easy one. It it became very complicated, very fast. And it was also Alton's first failure as well as a commander, which was a shock. And he does not take well to failure. Oh no. This was kind of the beginning of the end for poor Alton. (laughs) It's all pretty much downhill from here. And we see him, start to become more and more unstable throughout this, though it doesn't feel like it's unstable for the reasons we see with the other members of the psych, sometimes like Sunni, it feels more like he just can't take failing at stuff. And I think that it's something that resonates with, with Rin in some ways, like she can understand what's happening, but he's also just making p- poorer and poorer decisions as this goes on. And and his situation becomes more and more desperate as well because he had he was just coming off like a huge victory and he was getting the respect of the warlords and the public and everything. And then in one move, he lost all that. And not necessarily through the fault of his own but the other warlords took the opportunity to make him the scapegoat right so this whole idea of the systematic um adversity that they have to face as psych and as shamans and that kind of and spearly and spearly exactly so it's all woven into um 
to Kuang's world building as being like, look, here's now, of course, this first failure that was a group decision to let them in now became Alton's fault because he was the one championing thinking that he was about to negotiate the end of the war because of his great victory on the channels just a just blast scene so it was really interesting yeah I enjoy these moments of this contained battle that after this explosion just got really messy there's that moment with the person hanging off the building and Rin's watching on and it it just ends like so many yeah. things uh, brutally. And yeah, this, it was like a tense to save them, but it was all in vain. It, it, yeah. The public it's, fleeing and like trying to trample over each other and, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it's the reality of war sets in and it becomes this very grim, dark moment. For sure. So we also at this time, Neja comes back and he's healed up eerily quickly. Yeah, suspiciously quickly, yes. Yeah, and he's like, oh, it didn't hit anything vital. <laughs> and they're like, are you, that seems kind of odd. It yeah. seemed to go through in a pretty vital place. Yeah. And he, but he's acting like no big deal. And he, and Rin actually seems to be hitting it off pretty well. Yeah, when he they comes get buddy-buddy. Alton's like, he's a spy. And she's like, I'm not sure. And they're the only two that kind of have this understanding. I think Rin is bouncing around. Like a, a big theme in all of this is Rin's trying to find a group. And if she ever really becomes part of a group and the psych being one and her camaraderie with Neza back in Synagard is one. And she's never really finding a place to fit in and a lot of her driving force up to this point she was like well like i could leave but where am i gonna go i i have nowhere to get back to she's like i could quit but this like th those options are even worse than continuing because i would just be back to where i was as a peasant woman yeah. back th 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 there's nowhere to go for me so she's constantly looking to get along and the only time she ever feels focused is when she's in the pursuit of of power, I guess, and, 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 and in conflict. So really uh, just another level of her kind of bouncing around all these people and all these relationships and never quite hitting the mark with anybody. I think that something Rin's dealing with here is she might not like war any of this. In fact, I'd feel pretty confident saying she doesn't like it, mm, but she knows she's good at it. Mm -hmm. and when all the choices seem to suck, when she's actually good at something, it helps her feel like it's, to some extent, what she should be doing with herself. And it seems like Rin grapples with some of that during this time. Yeah, yeah her motivations are changed throughout this book but they start with this sense of like hey i'm good at this i can pursue this i can become more powerful eventually they turn into hatred and revenge and all these other things but for now she's motivated by like i got nothing better to do and i'm good at this and i see a path to getting better at it and that's kind of what got her to this point and now everything changes when she finds out she's spearly allegedly i'm still on the fence about that <laughs> but um she believes that she's Spearly and um, she meets all these other members of the psych that are in the same boat as her. And she starts to get to know Altan, who she had, I guess, a connection with, allegedly romantic feelings for at the beginning, that kind of stuff. So she she's riding this one out. Something I notice as we're talking about Alden again with Rin that comes up multiple times, which is an interesting part of her personality is despite all her ruthlessness and relentlessness, she still has so much desire for validation yes. from people that she admires. We mm -hmm. see that in the Academy or sorry, in Synagard when she's especially under Irja, I believe it is, is the, that's the, the tutor person. No, not that's Feyric. 
Urja, I think, is the name of the master who does the strategy. Oh, strategy? Yeah, him, but also Zhang, yeah. also. Yeah, and then, of course, Alton. She's looking for that praise from mm-hmm. oftentimes figures who don't want to give that much of it, and Alton falls in that category. And it's almost that piece where you don't get very much validation from someone, so then every little bit of it feels so good. And that's what Rin seems to be chasing from Alton. Right, right. It's what we were talking about with Rin as a character of this balancing her ruthlessness with her vulnerability, with every moment that she is um, putting aside any sort of, like she's self-harming herself to study. She's she's making all these sacrifices in the pursuit of power, but she's also just trying to be told a good job from someone that she admires. It's very true. It's interesting how both kind of pull her forwards. And it's a very honest human approach to, to Rin's character, which we've been Agreed. saying this whole time. <laughs> well, maybe we should mention that they go off and they fight a monster at this point yes. which feels different from anything else that's happened in the book it's an interesting sequence i think we it's a unique sequence yeah in the book i really i really like the idea that the monster takes the face of alton during this for yeah. rin and there's an amazing exchange between her and the monster posing as Alton Mm -hmm. where it's doing that because it thinks she won't kill Alton for whatever reason whatever monster powers it's using are telling it that and it says you can't kill me Alton hissed you love me and Rin says I don't love you and I can kill anything. <laughs> and she does kill the thing. And she's like, I don't really know what it means that the thing took Alton's form, nor what it means that it I think the thing I was wouldn't. grasping at straws, honestly. You really never had a great connection with anybody. Like it at first took the form of her like adopted like her stepbrother. And she already like left him behind. So she was like, That's not really working. And then it turned into Alton and it's like, whoever said that I loved Alton like <laughs> so it was just a one two and I, I think the monster just couldn't take like what other forms did he have as a choice <laughs> I think that's why it was so easy to dispatch um, Neza and um, kind of was the bane like Rin was the bane of its existence yeah Rin was, like is... the secret is I just don't love anybody <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting hey kid a might have might have been tough yeah yeah but once she realized yeah and it's true she had to be like why am i even talking to this to the kid i left him behind a long time ago it's like oh because he's a monster oh i can kill it and then it was like whoop changing strategies <laughs> Didn't yeah no i'm saying it. kite might have been oh uh, i thought you said the difficult. kid no oh kite yeah yeah, yeah that would have been a good one too yeah that's true it's interesting the monster chose alton instead i did it's it, also funny for me to hear that your reaction to it is this idea that Rin just doesn't love anyone, so yeah. it was gr- the monster is grasping at straws. Yeah. I think that's a totally valid interpretation. It's different from the one that I had, which was, hey, maybe she does have pretty deep feelings for Alton, or at least some of that infatuation where the monster would I think would the choose. monster was like, this is the only person in the whole world that Rin had anything you could call romantic feelings <laughs> for. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty fair. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I think I think the monster was like looking at the deck and was like, "Oh, these are terrible options," <laughs> <laughs> and just picked one. You know, Charles, it's like when we play cards against humanity, yeah. <laughs> and you just have a hand full of garbage. <laughs> that was the chime. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Looking at its options when it comes to Rin. And like you said, the baby, hey, you want to trade existence. a wheat for ore or sheep for ore? And it's like, oh, well, no. Katan, actually. Yeah. It's like, no, I don't want to trade that. And it's like, well, I had to try. That's all the only <laughs> offer I had is basically where this poor creature, this monster uh, was left. <laughs> it is funny to think of 
Rin as basically this monster's kryptonite yeah. because she is so ruthless and never developed do... a, a connection with anybody. Mm. Well, all right. Well, I'm glad we talked about that because that's a good moment. So Alton is also super skeptical of Neja throughout all of this, as you mentioned, Charles. Mm-hmm. And there's this really poignant moment where they're getting gassed, Rin and Neja, and Rin yes. is getting out of there, and she realizes, oh, crap, Neja got left behind, and they're going to get him. And she tries to go back to help Neja, and Alton stops her. And also, Alton goes back in, and he decides that it's more prisoner. important to get a prisoner yeah. than it is to get Neja. And that causes some tension between those two. Yeah. You know, it's just like the brutality of war. Like you read in so many other books, it's like, hey, you have to kind of step out of your humanity and make a practical decision because we're at war. And that was kind of Alton's philosophy. And Rin is still grappling with her sense of like, Neza was a, like worth saving a friend of mine and all this other stuff. Like we could have helped him. What good is this prisoner going to do? And um, yeah, it's just one of those consequences of war. And that, that Kwong presents that, it's really great. It's what makes this part of a uh, militaristic fantasy novel is these kind of ethical dilemmas. Exactly, Charles. Yeah. So then we meet Chagin. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, but he says Golan Nice is the real target, not Coeur d'Alene where we've been this whole time. And they end up going over to this other place, Golden Nice, to try to see if they can stop whatever's coming there. And they show up too late, I would say, Charles. Way too late. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. This is by far the most grotesque, Mm -hmm. grimdark moment in the whole book. Certainly a tonal shift. Even after this bombing of the city, you get into these descriptions, which we know Kwong has a very masterful understanding of Chinese, Japanese history, especially around World War II. And I remember reading somewhere she was like, yeah, I really didn't make that much of what I described in that up. Like that was all kind of from personal accounts from the rape of Nanking. Mm -hmm. And drawing on that realistic um, inspiration from actual history into this world it it was a really um, gory, grotesque, shocking and um, disturbing mindset just to be in that, that definitely had a profound effect on Rin for sure it's something that is really good to get a perspective on it's obviously really hard at times to read because of how much Kwong doesn't hold back in her willingness to tell about events that were pretty directly taken from real life history. And, you know, Charles, you and I growing up in New York, getting our education on 20th century events. Yes. This isn't something that's really delved into. So I think I learned a lot from getting this perspective and looking into the history behind it. Right. I think think what Kwong makes the, like part of her inspiration was obviously the history, but also the fact of like, yeah, you can read in a textbook, like this was the rape of Mm Nanking. This many people died. It was really bad. But then it's another thing entirely to go into the gory details of exactly what took place and using fantasy as a way to create a world in which a character experiences those things firsthand and how she takes these fantastical powers and then makes decisions after having lived through that. So it's a really interesting, like I remember when we go back to our like very first episode of why we like fantasy in the first place, it's just moments like these where you have a character like Rin and then the author gets this opportunity to be like, okay, what would a character capable of 
channeling power equivalent to a nuclear bomb do if they were like witness something as horrible as the rape of Nanking, you know? So it's like a very interesting um, dynamic that's starting to cook here in, in, in these scenes in, in um, how do we say it? Go- Golan Nice. Golan Nice. Golan Nice. And like you're saying, Charles, this does such a good job of putting us in Rin's perspective as she is having some changes in her perspective around what is and isn't worth doing. We know she's already prone to ruthlessness, but Mm -hmm. this drives home the point and maybe helps free her. I don't know if free her is the right way to phrase it. It helps take away any doubts she was really having about what she has to do to get vengeance. And Absolutely. it's tough to feel so locked into Rin's perspective while we're going through the brutality of this and to see a classmate of Rin's, which I think is such a good use of the, I guess, the pieces on the chessboard that Kwong <laughs> was looking at here. Well, okay, I got to make this even more personal and have stuff actually happen to the character, a character that we're familiar with uh, to drive home the point even more. And Venka ends up being a person who we get firsthand accounts from of how bad things got in Golden Nice. Yes. And, you know, it's it's relating to the, I think they're called the comfort women. (laughs) That's what they're referred to in, like, the history of the rape of Nanking. And it's just a horrible description. And um, I think she even says, like, you have, like, just kill them all. Just promise me that you, Mm -hmm. like, just destroy all of them. And Kite is there as well. He went through some stuff, not nearly as bad, but he, like, witnessed it all and had to hide under corpses and things like that. So everyone's kind of there, and she's kind of taking in, and Rin is kind of taking in all this information and, is making a profound shift in uh, in her mental well-being for sure exactly charles well i think we've said probably everything we can say about golan nice while keeping our uh clean episode <laughs> uh not getting without the getting into tag. the gory details yeah just... so let's move along then unless there's more that you want to say on that no let's keep this Let's keep this party going. So Rin's all in on Alton's ideas at this point, which are things like, hey, we need to wield as much power as possible. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to go to this mountain prison and we're going to unleash gods, essentially, right. upon this world. Not And not only gods, but people that basically mentally broke down so much that they weren't in control anymore of their godly powers and had to get locked up. Exactly. So unleashing gods that have possessed Un- yeah. people. At yeah. the, I mean, at the point that they're getting locked in Chulukorik, the people basically have lost control of themselves to the gods. Mm-hmm. They go there. They release Phelan, who was the previous commander before Tyr, that Alton and Tyr actually went to lock away together. Right. And Phelan, you can tell, maybe there's a bit of humanity left there, but not much. And (laughs) Phelan ends up escaping. We don't get much more from Phelan in this book, but obviously that's a loose thread that you expect to come up later on. For sure. And you kind of get to see, well, first off, we should probably talk about that they find Zhang. In That's the, the first mountain. person they release is Zhang. And Zhang basically is like, this is a horrible idea, bye. And like, does he like lock himself back up? Basically, Yeah, so he went to lock himself there. Mm. And they basically talk to him. And it's this last moment where Rin has a chance to say, actually... I'm going to redeem myself by 
embracing the ways of my mentor, which were right after all. But, but Rin she, doesn't take that chance. No. She and very deliberately sides with Alton. That's one of the things that I think sets the Poppy War apart from so many other novels. It's built so well toward the idea that you wouldn't take that chance, but there's still a lot of you, at least, that's rooting for her, too, because it's the right decision. Mm-hmm. And then there's also this knowledge that that's probably not going to happen because of how much Kwong has built toward the fact that Rin will not be making the right decision here. She's going to make a decision that we can understand from all the stuff that she's gone through, but one that will lead her down a path of destruction and death. Yeah. And this is also, um, she even, I feel like she doesn't necessarily believe that one person's right and one person's wrong. I think just at this point, after witnessing the atrocities of um, Golanese, she's like, he could be right, but it doesn't matter because these horrible things are happening and to just let them happen is the worst thing possible. And we need to, even if it means destruction, per, like let these people out and try and use these as a weapon. And, you know, that's one of the main themes of this whole book is the price of power, you know? And yep. is it worth pursuing? Like the pursuit of power and the price of power and, and things like that. And she's like, we need the power to defend ourselves from these horrible war crimes. And then it's like, okay, well, in your pursuit of power, you're just creating more violence. And so it's kind of that scale. And that was kind of her philosophy when she made that choice. Meanwhile, Alton is acting totally out of desperation because we know he's on the edge and he's always been on the edge. And he needs to believe that these people are redeemable and can be used and saved because he's on the brink of that himself. So he, and he's just suffered these massive defeats and he's just witnessed Golden Niece and he feels like this is the last card he has to play and he is willing to buy into it and believe it even though it's a really desperate situation. So the whole thing is is just kind of a dramatic, you're really not confident that this is the right thing to do, but the characters have their reasons for doing it anyway. And I just think that's a really interesting scenario painted by, by Kwong in, in this scene. That's also well said there, Charles. Like you're saying, Rin is aware that maybe this isn't the moral choice. Maybe this isn't even going to work. She actually seems to, based on her inner monologue during this time, not really think it is going to work, but she doesn't care at this point. And we understand why she doesn't care given everything that she's experienced and given what we know about how she was already predisposed to this kind of ends justifies the means type thinking. So Mm. I just think it's such an incredible job. And we'll get to this more with the actual end of this whole thing, but but it's such an incredible job by Kwong to write this corruption arc right. in a way that's built towards so well and so throughout. Incredibly well said. It's it's a corruption arc, and this is the phase where she's deliberately choosing violence, even if she's not totally bought into it as a means of getting revenge. It's like it's the beginnings of like she's not turning back at this moment, and she feels this desperation. And this is kind of the beginning of that. So she sides with Altan. They free um, the former Phelan. commander, Phelan, who controls like some wind god. And he... Is controlled by, more like. Truth. And then that god escapes. And there's like little, like you said, it's a loose thread. And every once in a while they drop a thing like, oh, he was clearly here because it's totally destroyed now. And so that happens. And they're like, okay, so maybe this was a bad idea, but in that moment, they get captured. They do. And after that, we we get two things, really. We get this sense that the Empress has betrayed them, which yes. maybe we're not shocked by after we saw what happened to Tyr. And we also go through more brut- brutality when they're taken to this lab and poked and prodded and experimented on and basically 
made to be dependent upon these experimenters from the Federation giving them access to opium and, and heroin, I believe, at this time, too. Yep. And it, it's another part that's tough to watch. That was read, drawn guess, directly from that, Kwong's exactly. um, military history background. Like, these were things that actually happened in World War II, and these human experiments in the name of science were horrible things that Absolute happened. Absolute atrocities. That happened in that time and she's pulling on that again weaving it into her novel and it's just a horrible moment it, it doesn't get too gory but you realize like it's set up for exactly the stakes here of like he's this doctor guy is not above just cutting them open and poking at their organs while they're still alive you know and that fear is very much alive and just Alton being back there there's a exactly. moment where he realizes where he is and he's like, oh no, I never thought I'd be here again. And it's just that, like, from Rin's perspective, you're like, oh God, is this is the place. I And now we're in real danger. Like, So that was very well done by Kwong, something that we were kind of, was building up to this moment. And then we're at the end of Alton's arc now when they accidentally, the prison guard accidentally injects both of them with heroin instead of just Altan, and that's what connects Rin to the Phoenix God. And then she gets that another moment of this no turning back moment of like, do I listen to the Phoenix or do I listen to Tezra or whatever? It's like, do I channel the fire God at this moment? Which was interesting. And we've been built... Yeah, built up to this moment in a way where we have a good idea what Rin is choosing from here on out. Yeah. <laughs> but Alten, of course, makes his choice. He can't, like, they're able to get free because of Rin's ability to call back the Phoenix God. And Alten's like, God, there's no <laughs> going back for me. Like, I've messed up so much up to this point, And, like, I'm so unhinged at this moment that I, I, this is I have to just obliterate this place from the planet, basically, and uh, which is what he does. And he does, and and it's also his mind him. breaking from the phoenix as well, which was foreshadowed for every member of the psychast to face that moment. And um, you know, the end of Alton's arc is a tragic one. It's just someone that's <laughs> at least he got to kind of wipe away the price that caused him so much misery. Yeah, and there's some some of what feels like justice in that he's able to do that mm -hmm. uh but but not not enough i guess it yeah. still feels very very tragic and alton just ends up being this really tragic character so right and then he finds out he the also, empress betrayed them also in that yep. moment i think as well right doesn't the before it's the, that it's but, the scientist that says like who do you think told us and he had a hard time believing it and that's when he came to that realization while he was imprisoned in the lab. Um, so when it's, he broke out, he's like, I got nowhere to go, nothing to do. I'm in so much pain. This is like, this is it. Yeah. And there's and an interesting... Dr. I, Shiro, Charles. Right. I, I looked it up. and There is something I want to mention just really, really quickly. I know we're, we're coming up on time here, but there's this fun moment where Rin and... Is his name Shigan, the shaman? Shig... Shig C H A G H A N oh. Shagan. They have a really quick exchange where he's like, "Of course, the tiles foretold this. You know, it's like this was the <laughs> prophecy. It wasn't. It wasn't um, Golan Nice. It was this." And Rin was like, "Enough. Like, you don't know anything. You can't just retroactively solve <laughs> the puzzle. You know, Rin's relationship with authority is." really unique in the world of fantasy and and i feel like a lot of times in fantasies like in fantasy novels characters in the leadership position get away with that like a dumbledore like character is like yes of course that was the whole time leading you to this moment a and i'm sure kuang was reading all this like why is the protagonist taking this malarkey just because they're <laughs> a person theoretically of power or of leadership and I think she's channeling through Rin this idea of like, you didn't know anything. And th to even suggest that that was the case is ridiculous because you're, you're just making it up beforehand. You don't get to do that. You don't get to, after the fact, act like you solved it. 
and I thought that was just a, before we moved on from this these realizations, uh, just to bring that moment up. I just love that moment. <laughs> I get the sense that that was cathartic for you, Charles. Yes, I was like, give me a break. And I and I think when you're writing someone who's dealing with leadership issues, authority issues, someone who's been trying to get approval from leadership figures, when you can finally just be like enough just stop <laughs> it's like something we don't get a lot of in fantasy but it feels very cathartic when we do get it so really great modern fantasy moment there <laughs> that i just wanted to bring up before we <laughs> went on to rin's final decision here <laughs> that's fair charles it was interesting to see <laughs> her push against the retroactive conclusion <laughs> so, yeah. from, from the prophecy yeah so she she gets this interesting moment where as Alton sacrificing himself, he tells her that she's stronger than he ever was, which was interesting to hear yeah, from him. Yeah. I, and then she swims to Spear and yeah. she she basically gets this moment where she can completely unleash the phoenix in a way that would, the way I read it, though I'm not sure if this is how it's supposed to be portrayed, but it's my sense, uh, it would unleash the equivalent of almost an even bigger version of dropping an atomic bomb. Right. Like when she describes um, the cloud, it's very reminiscent yeah. of like a mushroom cloud and the way the color in the sky changed and just the level of catastrophe that occurred it, it did harken back to um and given her her knowledge of like world war ii era war it, it seemed to me that it was very much a comparison to an atomic bomb but it wiped out a whole nation so yes it must have been a way higher higher a scale than, than an atomic for sure. bomb for sure uh, it, it, that's so, an important moment that come that like we figured out the true nature behind uh, Tirza, like that legend of how she chose to let the Spearleys die. She was like, that's the lesser sin here. It's like to deliberately choose to commit genocide of a people versus choosing to abstain from violence and letting what happens happens. Um, and Ren was just like, I'm not going to let that happen to anyone I care about. I would sooner kill those people. And so she makes that deal with the gods. And I also like that um, Kuang took that moment with the gods to make that very distinct, like, the gods are like elements. They don't make decisions for you. You are consciously choosing to do this. Like, she was very deliberately yep. like, this is you. You're make this is a result of your will, basically. I so much appreciate that Kuang <laughs> drives that point home yes. because she doesn't want us to have the excuse for Rin. Yes. Like, oh, we like Rin. She's yeah. human. In no uncertain we, terms. We want to think that it was the Phoenix's fault, yeah. but it was Rin's decision. And Kuang makes sure that you know that because, and I think this is such a big thing in this story, the theme is these atrocities get committed by people if we yeah. view them as just pure evil with no humanity then that is yeah relieving to feel that none of us are capable of committing evil like this right but and we see through rin that you can have humanity and still commit this terrible atrocity deliberately right it's like the atomic bomb is a powerful weapon but someone has to consciously make the decision to use those weapons mm -hmm. and so yeah i i do appreciate kuang's description of how the gods work and to interpret it as even the phoenix was like if you're choosing this this is on you like even the phoenix <laughs> god who's obsessed with destruction was like no when you do this that this is your fault <laughs> and she was like okay cool and uh yeah, that we get the giant mushroom cloud of destruction, that complete genocide that is Rin's decision to destroy the enemy and all the people that live in that country, not even just the soldiers, but the, the she makes a point to describe children and women and 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 just like local towns, people that didn't even know there was a war going on. You know, it's like she made that conscious description 
of exactly the scale in which she committed this act of violence. And only in fantasy can can one character channel a power that wipes out an entire race and then has to deal with the fallout of it. <laughs> you know, it's a really interesting position. Or at least Rin in such in. an instantaneous way yeah. that can be so clearly one person's decision to yes. do something so large. Right. And we we don't get a lot more time in this book after that. We get some of Rin grappling with the ideas of what she's done and there's a good moment where you know everyone around her is horrified by what she's done and mm-hmm. she is talking to Kite and yes, Kite that's says, what I wanted to make sure we talked about. Yeah. So Rin says they were monsters, they were not human. And Kite says, "Have you ever considered that that was exactly what they thought of us?" Right. And great moment. And I feel like Kite again like he's like the voice of reason. And I think there's a very profound moment happening at the end of this book that I think will have repercussions and then ne- I haven't read the next one, but I have a feeling that Kite is going to come back and and it's going to be under a different circumstance than when they were together in, you know, Kate's home. It's now Kate has witnessed her commit this horrible war crime. And for Kate, it's unforgivable. He's like, please tell me that the God like used you to commit this atrocity and that it wasn't you that willfully made this happen. And she was like, no point in lying about it. I, it was my will that made this happen. They were horrible people. You saw all the war crimes that they committed. And he was basically like, this was worse than anything else. Like, you just committed a genocide of a whole people. And he left. He left her at that moment, which I, I think, think Kwong did a great job of putting the weight of not only did she have to deal with committing, like pushing a button and a million people dying, but also the people around her are now leaving her. So the way to exactly Charles like you said you resonated with Kite and (laughs) what what he stands for and Kite is dealing with a lot of what we as readers are dealing with in that moment which is trying to come to grips with the idea that someone in Rin that we I would go so far as to say like or at least sympathize with yeah we've been rooting could, for her this whole time for sure exactly could do something so terrible and he wants that out like you were saying right. but Kwong and, and Rin aren't going to give us that out we need right. to just sit with this right and the semantics of it are very important and the fallout of it was was super critical as well it's just a really interesting situation that Rin now finds herself in at the end of this book it's like what's next you know we, you're always asked the question like if you could push a button and it would kill all these people what kind of effect would that have on you You never got to meet them you never got to know them and Kwong explores explores this at the end of this book and I imagine in much more detail in the next book but of like she basically pushed the button she didn't actually go there and see anybody that she killed she didn't the only witnessing thing she got to see was the mushroom cloud in the distance so it's this interesting idea of sitting with the knowledge of what you did and slowly realizing the like what was oh I pushed this button and the war ends great boop done like that's an easy thing someone as decisive as Rin would obviously make that choice but now she's sitting with the cost of that and it's such a huge horrible thing at so much bigger than just conceptualizing it right away she's getting it in pieces and every piece that she gets, it breaks her down a little bit more. And we only see the very beginnings of this with Kite leaving and with her, with her crew being kind of unsure about her. And she starts to kind of go past the point of no return into this broken person. So really quite the arc for a for a first part of this trilogy. It's like, whoa, <laughs> we've been through it all. <laughs> I know, Charles. I, one of the things I said when I was telling you why we have to read the Poppy War <laughs> is that Kwong finds a way to get through what feels like a trilogy's worth of events and themes and drives them all home 
mm-hmm. in only 500 some odd pages in a way that to me never felt rushed. Right. No, her her economy of words and her pacing were really great. She accomplished a lot and she earned every moment and um thoroughly impressed and she I think she set up a really great circumstance for book 2 where it's like now you have this this character arc has been completed where she goes from an ambitious youngster to like broken war criminal, right? It's a tragic arc. It's an arc of someone, you know, going through the ringer and coming out a violent, a horrible person. And now it's kind of like, well, how does she live with herself after this? There's still the Empress. There's still these other shamans out there. You know, there's still troops on the ground and they're on their turf. So, how does she come to terms with all of this? And does that affect how she continues her pursuit of revenge? And it's a great like thought experiment that I'm looking forward to seeing how Kwong handles in, in the second book. Well said, Charles. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm pumped to read the second book. I'm already maybe halfway through. Okay, I'm about 5%. I cracked the cover. (laughs) Well, you had some catching up to do, and I've been trying to pace myself so (laughs) we don't run into a little... I hope I remembered enough from this to make this conversation (laughs) Well, we were able to talk for like two and a half hours, so (laughs) I I think we're going to be fine. (laughs) Yeah, but it has been a few weeks for me since (laughs) reading the the first one. I've been trying to pace myself with... I mean, uh, you did forget the the gatekeeper, so... (laughs) I did forget the gatekeeper. Uh, (laughs) For that, I will never be forgiven. Nope. But we persevere, (laughs) Charles, and I think it's on to book two for our... I assume our next buddy read discussion. You always know this stuff way more than uh, I do. Let's take a look at the schedule. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, it, the schedule's changed so much, and it will continue to change. But basically, no. So <laughs> basically, no. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> dropping Poppy War Book One, and then we still have to finish Lord of the Rings. So, Lord oh, of the Rings back. Book Three will drop after this, and then oh, we're so gonna have Poppy War Book Two. And then we go into The Witcher. So things are getting really timey wimey for us over (laughs) here with the FDF podcast. We had to move a lot around to accommodate Dylan, where we just had to read The Poppy (laughs) War. And now, because we had to read it, here we are, um, much earlier than we've expected, dropping Poppy War. But you know what? You're going to get Poppy War. You're going to get Lord of the Rings. You're going to get Witcher. You're going to get um, Mark Lawrence, you're going to get Book of the Ancestor, and you're going to get Poppy War Book 3, which will be released as we're reading it. I mean, guys, that's a lot of high-stakes fantasy we're talking about here. we got a lot to cover. And Charles, after we've gone through two episodes worth of discussion... I still hear a little of this snarkiness coming with the, <laughs> we always have to accommodate Dylan. And it's totally fair. I know I have a history on our podcast of uh, making you take time to do things that <laughs> I've already done or whatnot. But <laughs> I appreciate your flexibility as always, Charles. Thank you, and kindly. Are you really going to tell me it wasn't worth it? (laughs) I will say reading this book was a fun experience, especially after coming off of Lord of the Rings. Like I said, reading this was a delight to go from old school to some of the most classic old school to some of the most fresh modern. Like this series is cutting edge stuff. The next book's coming out in just a few weeks. So it was a very rewarding experience. And um, it was just nice to read something new get a fresh a character that feels fresh in fantasy as a protagonist which you think you've read it all especially after reading people like George and Rothfuss and and then Quan comes in and, and still keeps it fresh so no it was a great experience I'm glad we did it this way I'm glad we get to read book three when it comes out it was all for the best like I said in, in our have to read episode I was happy to do it and we'll make it work, man. We're going to bring a lot of fantasy to the people in the next couple of weeks. I'm excited to do that with you, my buddy, Charles. And I'm excited to do it with my buddy over here, Dylan. It's, thank you for psyching me up for this and and 
vetting it, <laughs> I guess, and putting it on the table because I would have never even heard of this book um, without your recommendation. So, and now look you at you, Cheryl, now making look at a me. podcast episode about it. That's right. Well, anything else before I hit him with the outro? Let's hit him with the outro. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening to another exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. This has been part two of two of our Poppy War Book One Buddy Read Discussion. Uh, this is the Poppy War series by R.F. Wong. Really fascinating stuff. Can't get, can't wait to get into that next book. Uh, if you like what you heard here, if you want to hear more, definitely check out our older library of stuff download all those episodes follow us subscribe to us hit us up on social media at the ftf podcast on instagram and facebook and at the ftf podcast with the number one at the end for twitter and um, rate us five stars drop a hello on social media just let us uh, let us know you're listening and we really appreciate the time you put into listening to this and uh, we hope you enjoyed it nailed it charles nailed it well won't keep you guys any longer Uh, we'll just say for now uh, go forth and conquer friends